What do you think of when you think of revival? Maybe you think of a heart, like the monitor thing we have up here on the screen, where they revive someone's heartbeat. Or maybe you think about a spiritual occurrence. And in this country, we've had three or maybe even four, it depends on who counts. We have several things we call great awakenings, which are kind of spiritual where individuals in this country would be mindful about spiritual things, where they would put an emphasis on God and His Word and, and to study those things. And religion in those periods of times grows and flourishes. In the first century, we have the book of Revelation. And we have seven churches in Asia. Some who are doing all right, others who are having problems. And the, the church here in Laodicea is one of those places that is having difficulties. It's a very wealthy town. It's a great center for trade. Notice that they have a lot of money. In fact, the city was destroyed, and they were able to turn down uh, money from Rome and finance the rebuilding of the city themselves. So it was a great town, but... When you look at what was read for just a moment ago, and I appreciate Brandon doing that, you see a church in need of something, a local congregation there that was in need of some reviving, to come back to life spiritually, as it were, and we want to talk about that for a little while this morning. Because when you look at that first few verses there, verses 14 and 15, you see that there was a physician unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Here is the end and the beginning. The one who is there to help create all that was created. There is no better person in the world to give us this same type of advice, the same type of consultation than the great physician himself. And we call him the great physician of all the things that he did while he was here on this earth. Now when Jesus heard it in Mark chapter 2, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners then to repentance. We see that in Mark chapter 10. When he was gone forth the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked and said, Good master, and we know the account of the rich young ruler who wanted to follow Jesus and said, what should I do? And Jesus told him to keep the commandments. He said, I've done all of these things. But in verse 21, Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. What Jesus had going for him is something that we do not have going for us, nor does any doctor. Jesus was able to look into the heart and soul of the individual and to see what kind of issues there were. And he did that for this man. He looked on him and he loved him and he said, you lack one thing. Where every other person would have seen a pious and righteous man, Jesus saw the one thing that he was missing and told him that he needed to work on that. And even with all the complicated x-ray and MRI and CT machines uh, that we have today, we still can't see those spiritual the way that Jesus could. He was able to look and to see and notice what he said in Revelation 3 and verse 15, he said, I know thy works. He is the great physician and he's the only consultation that we will ever need. When he tells us something, we ought to heed him and listen to him. The church in Laodicea, they had that. that he said, I know your works. I know what you're doing and what you're not doing. I know where your strengths are. I know what your weaknesses are. Shouldn't we listen to somebody who can do that? Who can unequivocally say, I know your 
works. Jesus had a way of doing that. Look in John chapter 4. As he was passing through Samaria, he came to a well, and there was a woman there. And Jesus said unto her, Go and call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said, You have well said, I have no husband. For you, for thou hast had five husbands, and he which is whom now is not thine husband. And that you have said truly, and the woman recognized unto him, I perceive that you are a prophet. Jesus is able to look and just to see exactly what's going on. In a physician, don't you want that? Too many times, and we talk about medical issues and there's uncertainty. Well, we don't know about this or we don't know about that. and we're... Jesus looks and he knows where we're at. I know thy works. I know that you don't have a husband. You've had five now and the man you're with now is not your husband. I know you lack one thing. He knew. When we want counsel, when we want a first or second or third opinion, who should we call? should always be the one who can answer those questions. And you think the church of Laodicea, they had this problem. They were not there the way they ought to have been. And Jesus says, I know your works. He knows their works, the predicament now that they face, that thou art neither hot uh, cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee, spit you, vomit you out of my mouth. Their problem was that they were lukewarm. Jesus said, I wish you were really for me or really against me. But they were just there. Look at verse 16. Because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. You're just, they're just there. They act like Christians, but really they're not. They show up, but they're not there, if that makes sense. And it makes Jesus sick to his stomach. He said, I will spew you out of my mouth. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had something that just immediately dis did not like, and you spit it out? We were somewhere the other day. I think it was while we were on vacation, and I had a water. And I reached down for my glass of water, and I took a big old swig of Dr. Pepper, and it was not what I anticipated at all. Back in the days when I was flying, we used to go to these flying breakfasts at all these little small country airports, and they'd have, you know, a pancake breakfast. And we went to one, and I had my orange juice in this little styrofoam cup. And on this same table was the same styrofoam cup people had poured syrup in for your pancakes. You know what happens when you expect a mouthful of uh, orange juice, and you get a mouthful of maple syrup? You know what happens when you expect to have a, a faithful congregation living and working for you and they're, they're not what they advertise at all? It's like getting the wrong glass. You just spit it right back out. It disagrees. That's what happens with these folks here in Revelation and Church of Laodicea. It, that cup looked exactly like my orange juice, but inside it was not. It was not what it claimed to be. And in that case, it made Jesus spit them out of his mouth he says the people draw nigh to me with their mouth and I honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me but in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men they draw near to me with their mouths and they give me service with their lips but their heart is not with me just like the congregation in Laodicea well they, they, they show up every Sunday and they call themselves Christians but they're just lukewarm. They're just there. The only thing they do for the kingdom of Christ is keep that spot on the pew warm every Sunday. That's all they're doing. And Jesus says it doesn't sit well with them. Their problem was that they were lukewarm. That means our prescription is we need to be fired up. That's what we need. We need to be fired up. We don't need to be lukewarm. I got a lot of scripture right there, and we're not going to read all of it, but I want you to notice in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. The Christians, they that were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. That's what they did. That's who they were. They just told everybody about Christ because they were excited about it. Because they loved him and they wanted to tell folks about him. And Acts chapter 8 and verse 39, that Ethiopian eunuch, after he was baptized by Philip, they went down into the water, they came up out of the water, and he rejoiced greatly, so happy. So fired up to be in Christ. In Acts chapter 9, 
Saul, who would become the apostle Paul, was fasting and praying for three days. Ananias came and taught him the gospel. He was baptized and immediately straightway preached Christ in the synagogues. He was fired up. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 15, we see that Lydia and her household immediately offering Paul and Silas fellowship in their home, excited to be in Christ. The Philippian jailer in Acts 16 and verse 34, that same hour of the night washed their stripes, demonstrating his repentance, was baptized into Christ, him and his whole house, at that hour of the night now, put out a feast and rejoiced in the Lord. They were all fired up excited they weren't lukewarm they were excited to be in Christ in Titus chapter 2 Paul said Jesus who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people who are zealous wound up excited enthusiastic now about good works are we zealous of good works or are we lukewarm like the Laodiceans do we just go to bed excited every Saturday night like it's Christmas Eve because we get to come here on Sunday morning? Do we tell everybody about Christ and his church and the gospel because we are just fired up and zealous of good works? Paul says, let us not be weary in well-doing, Galatians 6, for in due time we shall reap if we faint not. I wonder if the Laodiceans just got weary. They just got weary and well-doing, and they got into a rut. And that just made them be lukewarm. They were just kind of, eh. You know, I'm not just going to go off into apostasy, but I'm not really going to be real fervent in my faith either. I'm just kind of, eh. And we feel that way sometimes, right? Physically and emotionally, we're just, <sighs> That's being lukewarm when it comes to our faith, when it comes to spiritual matters. And we can't talk about medical things, right, without talking about money. That's the worst part about the whole medical system, right? You have to have the right insurance plan or the right HMO with the right coverage to see the right folks. Well, see, the problem with Laodicea, as we talk about them being revived, is they had the wrong way to pay. They were caught up with the wealth of this world. They had the wrong currency is what they did. Remember, Laodicea was a wealthy city. Beyond what is hard for us to imagine, they rebuilt it from scratch themselves. Laodicea was a town where everybody had a lot of money. Jesus, in Luke chapter 12, spoke a parable unto them, said, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have much good laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, you fool. Tonight shall your soul be required of you, and then who's all these things going to be? In Acts chapter 18, Simon Simon the sorcerer, he saw the laying on of the apostles' hands and the giving of the Holy Spirit. He offered Peter money, saying, Give me this power also. And whosoever I lay hands may have the Holy Ghost. You can't buy the ability to lay on hands. Simon had the wrong currency. That rich fool had the wrong mindset. He had all of this earthly wealth and honored fame, right? When's the last time you saw a hearse pulling a U-Haul? You can't take it with you. Those things don't benefit us spiritually. Now, if we have money, we can do things to benefit the kingdom. We can help support mission trips and keep the lights on at the building and do all these wonderful things. But money is not the end all and be all when it comes to faithfulness. They had the wrong currency. They had tons of wealth, tons of money, tons of liquid assets. But we need the right currency. And I want you to notice what Christ said to these folks. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods, that you have need of nothing. But you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus said, I counsel thee to buy from me gold tried in the fire, something that had been tested and proved, that you may be rich, white raiment that you may be clothed. And that... The shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and that you anoint your eyes with a salve, 
that you may see. He said, you need to quit laying up for yourselves treasures in this world and start laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You need to come to Christ and get those spiritual blessings that come only through Him. That's what Matthew 6, 19 through 21 states, that we ought not to lay up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, but rather in heaven, where nothing will happen to those. Because he says in verse 21, where your treasure is there, where your heart be also. Why were they lukewarm? Because they spent so much time getting money and holding on to money that that was where their heart was. And they came to church and they were here and it was just something they did. They were lukewarm. I bet you they weren't lukewarm when the trading markets opened on Monday morning. I bet you they weren't lukewarm when it came to other aspects in their life. And we get the same way. We get so excited about vacations we go on or events that happen and, and what our kids are doing. But do we carry that same sort of fervor and hotness, right? Hot versus cold. That same sort of enthusiasm and activity level into Christ and our actions for him. In Matthew 13, beginning at verse 44, Again, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is locked into a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man has found it, for the joy therefore goeth and sold all that he had and, buy, and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is locked into a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And when he had found a one pearl of great price, he sold all that he had and bought it. One man found it by accident. One man was actively seeking it. But when they found it, they sacrificed. And notice what it says in verse 44. And for the joy thereof, he sold everything. The parable relates to us. Are we willing to sacrifice for the joy that comes with Christ? Will we let everything go and be happy and excited and zealous for him? Do we have the right currency? Are we concentrating on spiritual wealth and riches? Are we keeping and obeying the commands of Christ? Are we putting more emphasis on the stuff that happens in the world and hobbies and work and fan, friends and family and all that stuff is fine and good and well but if it keeps us from Christ if it keeps us from being excited about Christ and what we do for him and the salvation that he has offered well then we have issues in verse 19 he gives them a promise as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous, therefore, and repent. Did they have to stay lukewarm forever? You go pour water, and you leave it sitting out, it's going to be lukewarm. Can you make that water hot? Yeah, you can. Can you make it cold? Of course. But it doesn't have to stay lukewarm. They were on the wrong side of this love. And we know what it's like sometimes. You know, our parents all, well, let me back up our parents always love us when we mess up sometimes that is shown through discipline and chastisement when we do good it's shown through praise and reward Jesus says I love y'all but y'all are on the wrong side of that this time because I love you I rebuke and chasten and Hebrews chapter 12 beginning in verse 5 is a talk on discipline have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Ain't that the truth? And if we endure chastening, God deal with you as sons. Now look at verse 9. Furthermore, we have fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? The same kind of discussion is what Jesus is giving the folks in Laodicea. I love you and you are messing up and I will chastise, rebuke, chasten you. Paul gives the same talk to the folks in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, right before he gets into chapter 5 and, and berates them for the sin which they are keeping, he says, what will you do? What will you have? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love? And in the spirit of meekness. He said, your choice congregation of Corinth you're messed up you need some reviving you've got some issues and I am coming and I will be there with a rod of correction or I will be there in love with the spirit of meekness your choice you ever do that as parents your room better be clean when I come home if it's clean we'll go to the movies if it's not everybody gets a beating 
or grounding or however it is you discipline your children. Your choice, right? I'm coming. I will be home at a given time. Here, here's what you have to do. You will either do it and be rewarded or not do it and be punished and disciplined. We still love them. God still loved them. They were loved, but they were on the wrong side of that. We need to be on the right side of that. We see in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in, well, before verse 20, this, that this man had some servants, and he went into a far town and left his servants in charge of things. Five talents to one, two talents to one, and one talent to another. And so he that received five talents came and brought five other talents and said, I've delivered you. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. The one that had two talents had doubled that as well and brought it before his master. And his master said unto him in verse 23, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Luke chapter 15, we won't read that for time's sake, but you know the parable of the prodigal son. He had two sons. The younger son, I want everything that's bestowed to me, and he good it. He got it early and left. Wasted it all on riotous living. He came to himself. We see his repentance. He knew where he was at. He said, I'll just go and ask my father to take me in as a servant. Once he had demonstrated that, his father fell on him and loved him and kissed him and welcomed him in, brought the robe and the ring and killed the fatted calf and made a merry-making uh, merry opportunity from it. Because he had repented. Jesus says the church at Laodicea. In verse 19. He made them a promise. As many as I love. I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Which side of this do we want to be on? Do we want to be lukewarm. And show up at the pearly gates. And be chastised and rebuked. And sent in the other direction. Than we want to travel. Or do we want to be on the right side of this promise and the love that's given and hear that well done, thy good and faithful servant? That choice is ours. Jesus gives them the option, right? To repent. But just like any medical thing, we see that there is a procedure here, and that begins in verse 20. They have a choice of what they can do. Notice what Jesus says. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. There he is. What happens when there's a knock on your door? Well, you generally check and see who it is and open the door and answer it. The, cho the, the church here at Laodicea has that same opportunity. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me to him that overcometh. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father at his throne? But go back to verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The next word is only two letters, but it's very important. If. If any man hear my voice and open the door. Will the church at Laodicea hear? Will they open that door? In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They had land, they sold it. They had a choice to give all the money to the church the way that Barnabas did or to lie about it and keep back some of those profits. That's what they did, and it cost them their life. In Acts 8 and verse 22, Simon the sorcerer, right? We just read he wanted to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter told him, repent, that the thought of your heart should not perish with you. And we see that when presented with that choice, Simon prayed that it would be forgiven of him. When given a choice to do the right or the wrong thing, Ananias and Sapphira made the wrong choice. Simon the sorcerer made the right choice. These people here in Revelation 3, the church at Laodicea, we don't, we don't know what choice they made. Did they choose to repent and be once again zealous for the cause of Christ? I hope that they did. But I do know that I can't go over to Asia Minor right now and visit the congregation at Laodicea. Now, it's been 2,000 years. A lot happens, I understand. But I wonder what choice they made. I wonder what choice we will make. Jesus is still standing at the door and knocking. Will we hear him? Will we choose to hear him, right? Some people knock on your door. You just act like you don't hear. 
You look out there and say, ooh, I don't, I don't want to talk to those people, so I'm just going to sit in here. If you've ever been door knocking, every time we go door knocking somewhere, I'll do that. I'll walk up to the door and, and the blinds move and wiggle. You can hear the TV cut off and you stand there and you stand there. You hear shuffling. Of, and ain't nobody coming to the door. I know you're there. You know I'm here, but you ain't coming out. Do we hear Jesus and open it, or do we just act like he's not there? When he opens that door of opportunity for us for evangelism or benevolence or whatever it is for us to serve him in the kingdom, do we just act like that door's not open? To act like nobody is there demanding our attention. In Mark 16, he saith unto them, But who say he that I am? Oh, that's Matthew 16. Uh, Mark chapter 16 Go into all the world Preach the gospel unto every creature He that believe and is baptized shall be saved He that believeth not shall be condemned We have the choice This morning To be obedient to the gospel of Christ To put him on in baptism To be zealous to rejoice the way That those in the book of Acts That we noticed earlier did Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2 Fear none of those things which shall use that which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation for a short time, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. We have a choice every minute of every day to be faithful to God. What are we going to choose to do? We have the great physician who's given us the only advice we need. It's the advice he's given to the church at Laodicea here. Be hot. Be on fire for him, for his truth, for his church. Tell folks about it. Encourage it. Nourish up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Bring folks to the Christ. Do Bible studies. Are we fired up about it? Or are we just lukewarm? So often the case, we look at our lives and we're just, we're just there. We're physically alive and spiritually, we're just dead. We're just taking up space. When's the last time you did something for the cause of Christ besides warm up that spot you're sitting right now? You know, some Christians' whole duty in the kingdom is to keep that pew from floating off into space. It's true. Sometimes that's all we ever do for the Lord is just sit right there. And that's something we need to do, but that's not where our duty to his stops. But that's where the Laodiceans had stopped. They were lukewarm, and we see, just like that mix-up at the airport, Jesus spewed them out of his mouth. If you are outside of Christ, you can't go to heaven, and that's where the Laodiceans are at now. They are in a position where they are outside of Christ. And Jesus didn't write them off. He said, repent and be zealous. Come back. If you're dead and in the world and you need to be baptized into Christ to put him on, I pray that you, you take this morning as an opportunity to, to do that. But if you're here this morning and you're lukewarm, it's nothing to be ashamed of because it can be fixed. And a lot of folks suffer with that. That spiritual rut that we, we just can't seem to get traction and we're just listless in church, in our faith, in our service to him. You can get back on the right track today. You can get hot and fired up and zealous for good works. They have a choice. What choice will you make as we stand and as we sing? Yeah.